Lecture number four for Western Civ one. The archaic roots of Western civilization in the Mediterranean. For our devotion day, I'd have you think about Psalm chapter 33, where David writes calling for us to praise God. But we praise God because he's faithful and he loves righteousness and justice, but also because God is in control and he's working out his purposes, even amongst the affairs of nations. As we pick up in verse 6, what we read is, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep in his storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers all everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Our hope should indeed be in God, who is ultimately in control of the affairs of history. What we find is he raises nations up for his purposes, and what we've seen already is that uh, uh, the Israelites' experience in the world was shaped by uh, surrounding neighbors at times, that at times God used people like the Egyptians or later the Assyrians uh, to discipline Israel, to focus their attention on the fact that uh, they needed to depend upon him. Beyond these people groups, there's another people group that God was raising up in time to serve his purposes, and that would be the Greek-speaking peoples. We have our first references to people uh, coming from the islands of the Aegean uh, back in Genesis. There's not a whole lot of discussion about the Kaftarites, uh, but uh, the later scriptural passages would indicate that uh, this is where the Philistines came from, uh, generally thought to be the area of Crete and the Balkan Peninsula. Certainly there were people groups who came through and helped shape the uh, context where the Israelites came to settle into Canaan. And then at later times, we'll find that there's a resurgence of Greek influence, uh, particularly through some cultural things like their music. We begin to find even in Persian uh, culture, uh, in the time of Daniel, where we find that there's all kinds of musical instruments that are referred to, and that these are going to include Greek musical instruments. We're going to find they're quite famous for their music and entertainments. But as we think about the uh, Mediterranean roots of Western civilization, uh, the people groups of the Balkan Peninsula and the coast of the Aegean in the central portion of the Mediterranean Sea are going to contribute a great deal to the shaping of Western civilization. And as Christians, as we view history, we'd say this isn't just by chance. Uh, God works through these people movements and individual choices to weave his purposes. Uh, nations have their aspirations, but God has his purposes, and ultimately his plans come into being, and we can trust him. We trust that even now he's working through us and pray that he might use us in our time and pray that he might use our study here of our culture uh, to better understand people and that this might be used in God's providence to help us to be better servants for him and to advance his kingdom here in this world. So as we move to talk here about the early Aegean civilizations, what we need to understand is that uh, this people group is one that comes to be known to us through um, historical study and archaeology. Uh, not much was known about these people groups until relatively modern times. There are stories that were told that perhaps contain something of a historical memory about this early time period. But let's begin today by talking about these early Aegean civilizations and how we get to know about them. Uh, we have writings from 
early Roman sources that talk about people in this region. We have small references in the book of Genesis uh, to the spread of people throughout the world. But um, what we find is there are people that come to live in the Balkan Peninsula. That's the area of Greece as it sticks down into the Mediterranean and into the Aegean. That would be the uh, portion of the Mediterranean Sea between uh, Crete and Turkey and Greece. Uh, there in the Aegean area we find that there was a people group that emerged uh, back in the early Bronze Age using bronze technology and ceramics and they appear to come from an Indo-European linguistic group. And there's two groups of people that we'll particularly look at here today. The first of these will be the Minoans and the second will be the Mycenaeans. Now we don't know that the Minoans knew themselves by that terminology. That's actually something that comes as a historical artifact from the excavator, uh, Sir Arthur Evans, who thought that he had discovered the palace of King Minos uh, from Greek mythology. An early stu student of uh, Bronze Age culture in the Balkan Peninsula and in the area of the Aegean was Heinrich Schliemann. He was an entrepreneur who made a lot of money uh, selling indigo and uh, he was something of a polyglot. He knew lots of languages and uh, uh, was good in a number of different things. But in his old age, he invested his uh, wealth in pursuing uh, aspirations that he had early on in his life as he'd studied Greek as a young stock boy. Um, he had studied a variety of different languages, which he used in his business purposes, but in studying ancient Greek, he was fascinated with the stories of Homer in his Iliad and his Odyssey and was convinced that these things were based upon historical realities. And so when he was a wealthy older man, he pursued these things and becomes the father of uh, the uh, archaeology that helps to inform our understanding of the Mediterranean. Following various clues in the texts, he went to, to excavate in the plains of Ilium and actually found the site of Troy. Uh, as he excavated there, he observed that there were layers of occupation and uh, believed when he found a treasure that he had found King Priam's treasure. Subsequently, he decked out his wife in all kinds of treasures that he had. And for a long time, these things were lost. Uh, they've recently been uh, made available uh, as treasures that the Russians had taken from the Germans after World War II, and so they've reappeared in public these days. But uh, Heinrich Schliemann went on from Troy to excavate in Greece, and there uh, he believed that he had f found the burial place of King Agamemnon, who's mentioned by Homer in his story of the Iliad. Heinrich Schliemann opened up an area of study. He was followed by others like Sir Arthur Evans, and it's Sir Arthur Evans who excavated at Knossos in the island of Crete that we attribute the name Minoans to the people who lived there in the Bronze Age. The Minoans flourished uh, at the end of the third millennium and moving into the first half of the second millennium BC at Knossos. And as Sir Arthur Evans excavated there for years, uh, he named his discoveries after the legendary King Minos, who had the Minotaur in his labyrinth, because he found storerooms that were labyrinthine and uh, uh, things that he attributed to those stories. The Minoans are an interesting group of people who had a great deal of cultural sophistication seen in the uh, aesthetics of their artwork. Uh, but how is it that they could afford to have these decorated palaces and large storerooms? They're understood to be a Thassilocracy. That would be that they're a, a society that's built upon dominating the seas. There are people who engaged in trade because the area of the Aegean is not particularly rich in agricultural potential. The soils are thin it's very, very rocky, and there's just not a whole lot of flat places to grow things well. 
And so these people, like the Phoenicians, would depend upon trade, sailing around the Mediterranean, and it appears they had very long trade routes that would connect them all the way to Egypt. So they engaged in long distance trade, uh, being able to sail beyond the sight of land uh, and to make it all the way to Egypt. In their frescoes, their painted wall paintings in some of their palaces, we find some insight into their society. Uh, their artistic work uh, points to us some of the things that were valuable to them. It gives us some indications about their religion. Uh, seem to be fascinated with bulls and snakes along the way. But uh, in their artwork, uh, what we see is that they have uh, athletic events. Particularly famous would be their engagement in bull jumping. Uh, boxing, dancing, fishing, and various other things. So they have these colorful painted frescoes that adorn the walls of some of their palaces. What we see in these depictions that are preserved is that they lived in multi-story buildings and with a great deal of sophistication. That type of sophistication is possible uh, when there are resources. So they, these are apparently fairly wealthy people, at least amongst the cultural elites, and they did engage in communications. Again, their voices have echoes of long fallen silent, uh, but uh, they appear to have used a style of writing called Linear A, and uh, Linear A is essentially pictographs. Most of these appear to be uh, receipts and that sort of thing. There's only one extended text that I know of, and that's the Phaistos disc, uh, where it seems to be an extended, uh, perhaps literary uh, document. Uh, but this society thrived for about 500 years. They don't appear to have had large fortifications, so they seem to have felt pretty secure. But this society very quickly came to an end. It appears that the island of Santorini, also known as Thera, uh, was the cause of this demise as there was a cataclysmic event a volcanic explosion that caused a tsunami around the area of the Aegean and across the Mediterranean, uh, bringing an end to the civilization. The Minoans are then supplanted by the Mycenaeans, again, still living here in the area of the Aegean. The Mycenaeans are going to be around from about 1450 until 1200 BC. Uh, they're, they're known because of the excavations of Heinrich Schliemann at Mycenae, and they give their name to this uh, civilization. And uh, the Mycenaeans lived in very different times from the Minoans. They too had their cultural assemblage of artifacts they leave behind. Certainly there wasn't the same artistic skills being demonstrated, um, but these people lived in a time of uncertainty. Uh, we would know this because they have what is oftentimes known as Cyclopean architecture. That is, they have very large stone walls that protected their cities. Stones that are so large that it would appear that only a giant could possibly move stones that are that large. The Mycenaeans are particularly uh, associated with the events of the Trojan War. And uh, as we look at this culture, what we're going to find is there's a number of accomplishments. Uh, but also some limitations. Again, they seem to be a people who are fearsome. They lived in uncertain times, and so they had these very strongly walled, fortified cities. The Mycenaeans uh, communicated using something called Linear B. Uh, this is a pictographic, syllabic sort of writing that uh, was interpreted by a uh, architect in 1953, a fellow by the name of Michael Ventris. Uh, he helped to crack the, the uh, code here and to help people to understand this style of writing. These people lived in, uh, again, these walled cities. They had very distinctive uh, palaces and uh, they used distinctive style tombs, uh, these beehive style tombs. Uh, this seems to be a culture that glorified war. But while they had these huge fortified cities with imposing walls, all of these cities fell to invaders. They're all burned and destroyed. This comes about with what's known as the Doric invasion. We don't have any specific 
accounts of the Doric invasion, but there's a different people group that emerge into the area and uh, bring about an end to Mycenaean civilization. And with the coming of the Dorian invasion, you have the spread of iron technology and proliferation of tools and weapons. And this is going to bring on a period uh, known as the Greek Dark Ages. The sun still shone bright in the Mediterranean, I'm sure, but it's dark insofar as our knowledge. We don't know a terribly great amount about what all happened. What we can sleuth out is that there were a number of people groups who migrated. We might think even today about why people might migrate. Why would they push in and disrupt peoples who already live in a place and compete for resources? Generally, this is because there's a large population that's unhappy about something in their circumstance. Perhaps they're food poor, and this would drive the population into places where they perceive there to be uh, food resources. And that would pressure them to move here towards the south. Perhaps there's something of a climatic uh, fluctuation, certainly when you have volcanoes erupting and spewing uh, pyroclastic material into the atmosphere, that can bring at least short-term uh, climatic changes. Uh, but the Dorian invasion uh, is evidenced by the languages of people. We also have the Ionians and the Aeolians who come into the area of the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, in this time period of the Greek uh, Dark Ages, it appears that they adopt the Semitic alphabet from the Phoenicians. And as we come towards the end of this period, we have stories that are written by the blind poet Homer. The two famous Homeric epics are the Iliad and the Odyssey. These poems are written in something called dactylic hexameter. They have rhyme and meter. They're very, very long poems that could be sung and therefore remembered. These poems are going to be very influential in shaping subsequent Greek society. In many ways, uh, Homer's writings are seen to be the Bible of the ancient Greeks. They still tell stories about the relationship between the gods and men and conflict that goes on in Earth. And uh, we'll find that the subsequent Greek-speaking peoples will come back to this time and time again and to these stories. So Homer writes around the year 800 and uh, tells his stories. The Iliad is the story of the conflict between uh, the Achaeans and the Trojans. The Achaeans were people who lived in the area of the Peloponnesus and along the coasts of Greece. and They came into conflict with the Trojans who lived on the northern coast of uh, Turkey, as we have it today, the plains of Ilium, uh, because of an event that took place. Now, as we read the Homeric story, we don't have all the explanation. We have to depend upon later explanations as far as the background uh, to the the conflicts that take place between the Achaeans and the Trojans. But uh, according to Greek mythology, the gods were invited, of course, to a wedding, and. Uh, they bring gifts, as all good uh, guests should. And uh, yet there was one goddess who wasn't invited. The goddess who wasn't invited was the goddess Eris, Discord. Perhaps this sounds familiar to you in some of the story to stories that you might have been told or the Disney movies that you might have watched. Have you ever watched Sleeping Beauty? Who didn't get invited? Ah. The result was that there would be a uh, calamity in a kingdom. Well, in this story, what happens is the goddess Eris, who's not invited, decides to send a gift anywhere, and so she sends a golden apple inscribed to the fairest. An apple that she throws into the midst of the guests, and amongst the guests are three female deities. Uh, these goddesses were uh, goddesses that can be known variously as uh, Athena, uh, and Aphrodite, and Hera. These three goddesses were all rather vain, and so each one assumed, of course, that the, the apple must belong to them. And this is the seeds of the Trojan War. As these gods get involved with the goddesses, and 
the goddesses try to discern who's the fairest of them all. Um, they call upon the father of the gods, Zeus, who wisely declines. Uh, but uh, the result is they end up asking a young man by the name of Paris, and he's wooed by each of the goddesses with her uh, resources. He could have great wisdom and power, but he falls for Aphrodite's appeal, the love of the most beautiful woman in all the earth. The problem is that the most beautiful woman in all the earth, Helen, is already married. And so as he gains her attentions and uh, woos her away, uh, this is going to be the start of this war, because this shepherd, who seemed rather unassuming and unimportant, is in fact uh, the lost son of the king of Troy. And as he goes home, uh, he has the affections of the most beautiful woman in the world. It leads a war as her husband aspires to have her restored to him and calls his war uh, friends uh, to go with him on this campaign against the Trojans. So what happens here is we find that there's capricious gods who side on either side of the conflict. And the result is that there's a long drawn out battle uh, between the forces that invade and the forces that resist there at Troy. So the gods are at war with each other and it's reflected by conflict on the earth. As you perhaps know this story, the battle goes on a long time and uh, various champions fight battles. Uh, so eventually we have Achilles avenging himself upon Hector and uh, eventually Achilles himself being killed. The battle goes on for years and resolve to keep fighting wanes. But eventually a strategy is developed uh, where the Achaeans will appear to have retreated, to have disappeared, but they leave behind a gift, a wooden horse which the Trojans subsequently pull into the city in spite of the protestations of a priest who tells them not to do so. He warns them, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Hidden within the wooden horse were soldiers who would provide access to the invading forces, and the result would be that the kingdom of Troy would fall and the city of the Trojans would be destroyed. The woman who is the most beautiful woman in the world would be restored. Uh, but all the soldiers who went on this battle didn't get to go immediately home. As the gods were involved with all these, one of these people that would not get to go immediately home was Odysseus. He was a king from Ithaca, down in the south part of what we know today as Greece. And um, he goes on a 10-year a series of adventures as he tries to go home. And this is the uh, subject of the sequel, the Odyssey, as it tells about his adventures trying to get home as his wife is being besieged by suitors who say that he must be dead. And uh, she basically fends them off for years until eventually he's going to be able to get home. But along the way, what we learn is something of uh, what was valued by the Greeks in their stories. So they've clearly valued war and uh, nobility of, uh, and courage. They also uh, admire faithfulness, uh, particularly amongst women, uh, and uh, duty, but also being clever. Odysseus is a clever fellow. As he embarks on his epic adventures, some of them take him against impossible odds. And this is going to provide some uh, resources that uh, are still used in making literary allusions. They don't happen quite so much anymore, but this is going to be something that informs people in Western society use for years and years. And so as a result, people who have to make impossible decisions might talk about sailing between Scylla and Charybdis, two horrible choices um, that threaten one's existence. As far as stories that talk about the cleverness of uh, various individuals, one that's uh, memorable, perhaps some of you might have some familiarity with, would be uh, the story of the Cyclops. Uh, 
a cyclops was a giant with a singular eye. And the Achaeans, led by Odysseus, uh, become to be captured by one of these cyclopses. And he basically plans to eat them. Uh, but the cyclops is a shepherd. And as he has the Greeks cooped up in his cave, uh, ready to eat them at his uh, whim, uh, he's a, something of a shepherd, and so he has to let his sheep out to eat. But as he preserves his uh, alive and juicy uh, people to eat, he strikes up something of a conversation. And as he has a conversation with Odysseus, um, Odysseus tells his captor that his name is Nobody. As the story goes on, Odysseus uh, prepares a hot uh, spike that he uses to blind uh, the Cyclops. As he causes the Cyclops great pain, uh, the Cyclops in his cave calls out in pain, but he calls out in pain, he basically says, nobody is hurting me, nobody is hurting me. And the result is that the other Cyclopses uh, left the situation alone. So the Cyclops is blinded, but the men still can't get out of the cave because there's such a huge stone that closes the entrance. But the Cyclops, hearing the pitiful bleating of his sheep, uh, basically comes to understand that he needs to let his sheep out. But blinded as he is, uh, you know, he doesn't want to let any of the nasty Achaeans out. But uh, as the sheep make their way out of the cave under his hand, he feels their backs, but the Greeks cling to the bellies of the sheep and pass through unscathed. So in this story you can see that uh, uh, cleverness is involved, uh, certainly wit is admired amongst the Greeks, and eventually Odysseus is going to make it home, uh, where he's going to slay the uh, suitors of his wife who've been busy eating from his pantry, and he's going to reveal himself, uh, well, he's f revealed first of all to his old dog and to an old nursemaid, uh, but eventually uh, to his son and to his wife. And so this is actually a Greek story that has something of a, a happy ending at the end of it. But we get insight into Greek society and its values. Now, moving about 100 years later, around the year 700, we have the early writings of a fellow by the name of Hesiod. And Hesiod writes something called the Theogony. In the Theogony, he talks about the origins of the gods. And what we learn is that uh, there were earlier gods than Zeus and the like, um, that there were um, all kinds of interactions amongst the gods that helped to explain why things are the way they are. And so there's in this mythology, we find they deal with all kinds of uh, uh, stories and issues of their time and provide some explanation for why things are the way that they are. Now, about the time of Hesiod, back in the 8th century BC, uh, we have the beginning of archaic city-states in the Balkan Peninsula. These city-states were where people lived together in relatively large groups uh, to defend each other. Sometimes they would have a high place, an acropolis, from which they could uh, defend themselves. Uh, around that high place might be a plain where they could grow crops and have various resources that they might need. In the time period from of the 8th century up through the 6th century, we find that these archaic city-states developed and engaged in trade, but also in spreading out around the Mediterranean. Uh, they're going to engage in uh, colonization as they send out colonies to other places, and there's some formative events that take place uh, in this time period. Uh, these Greek city-states uh, share in common some of their culture, uh, particularly their gods and their very superstitions. Uh, they will hold to an Olympian pantheon of 12 major gods. There will be offspring of those gods, but uh, as I mentioned in Hesiod, there's explanation that those gods come from earlier gods, 
First of all, you had the gods of heaven and earth, who gave birth to the Titans, and eventually the Titans, the second generation of gods, gave birth to the Olympians. And uh, there was war in the heavens between the Titans and the Olympians. And so we find that this is somewhat similar to stories of wars amongst the gods in the Mesopotamian stories. But the Greek-speaking peoples here shared these gods in common. So they had some religious similarities, although they would worship different gods as patron gods of different city-states. These city-states uh, developed the early basis of the poles, a polis. And what we're going to find is that, shaped by their geography, these city-states developed very differently. What you need to understand is that the geography has a great deal of influence in shaping the Greek city-states. About 80% of the Balkan Peninsula is mountainous. This means that in the valleys where cities might develop, that there were uh, isolated communities. And the result is that, you know, with sharp mountains in between them and isolation, uh, that these societies grew up independently of each other and sometimes would be rivals with each other. The mountains of Greece are largely uh, metamorphic, made up of metamorphic rocks. As, uh, there's lots of tectonic activity in the area. Uh, these rocks are fairly heavily eroded and the result is there's not a whole lot of uh, topsoil in the valleys or even on the hillsides. Uh, this is going to limit their potential for agriculture. Uh, what trees were there were oftentimes harvested rather uh, vigorously for fuel and the result is they don't have a great deal of timber. Um, they're going to depend sometimes upon importation for large dimension timber. Uh, some of these city-states are going to engage in maritime trade. They're going to look towards the sea rather than the land as a means for their subsistence. But not every city-state has access to the sea. Some of them are in isolated valleys and they'll grow up as small agrarian states that are limited by their agricultural production uh, in regard to their potential growth in population. As these Greek city-states uh, emerge and compete with each other, um, many of them are hungry for resources. Uh, they suffer from a certain sort of land hunger as their populations grow and they need resources. And so they looked beyond their shores and uh, where all they could reach out. And so some of these Greek city-states would reach across the Aegean Sea onto the coast of what we know today as Turkey. This would be known as the Ionian coast, as people uh, spoke an Ionian dialect. Others would look further north up on the coast of the Black Sea. Still others would look towards the west, to Sicily and Italy, as places that they could colonize. In fact, some would look south all the way to Egypt. And so the result would be that we'd have cities like Miletus establishing colonies on the Black Sea, colonies like Byzantium, which will be of great significance later on. The city of Corinth, located on the Isthmus, this narrow neck of land between the mainland and the Peloponnesus, this peninsula that sticks out beneath Italy, uh, would establish as a colony over in Sicily, the city of Syracuse, a city which would grow in fame and size as time went on. Other cities would establish colonies in Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece, the southern part of uh, Italy. And so Sparta, for example, would create a um, colony at a place called Tarentum. These city-states uh, were in economic competition with each other, and sometimes they'd come into physical conflict also. What they shared in common was a basic language and uh, religion, religious ideas, and they also had something shared was uh, how they fought their battles. Their military was very important to them, and it was important for these city-states they have citizens who could fight. And so something that emerges amongst these archaic city-states was armed soldiers that the Greeks knew as hoplites. These are heavily armed soldiers, citizens who could afford armor made out of metal, uh, 
particularly bronze. They would wear shin greaves and have heavy uh, shields and breastplates and uh, would go to battle with their pointed weapons like spears and swords. The hoplites were the basic uh, force that were used by these Greek city-states. During this archaic period, they seem to have developed the use of the phalanx. This is where the hoplites would march in rank and file. So they'd march in lines together uh, with their shields all on the one side, protecting the person next to them. And uh, using their spears, uh, they would charge their enemies and use the weight of this group of soldiers with one person in the uh, uh, ranks pushing upon the one who is in front of him. And so with ranks and files, uh, they would push into their enemy and the mass would knock their enemies over. And by using unbalanced formations, they sometimes could turn their enemies and make them vulnerable on their shieldless side. So these cities that develop, there's all kinds of these little cities, but there's two that develop uh, early on that develop very, very differently and just show something of the difference amongst these city-states. Now, a later Greek philosopher by the name of Aristotle will study the constitutions and arrangements, the political arrangements, of these poles of the Greeks. And uh, what he demonstrates is that there's a wide variety amongst them. The two that are most famous, however, would be the cities of Athens and Sparta. Athens, located uh, on the coast near the uh, isthmus that joins the Peloponnesus to the mainland was in something of strategic position. Uh, along the coast, we're going to find they're going to look towards the sea. They have a small coastal plain, a defensible location with an acropolis, an upper city, and um, they're going to be able to develop a community there. Now, as they develop, they don't have great resources. They do have some flat land for agriculture. They do have coastal access, and they do have uh, defensible locations in the hills. But as they develop, they develop as a monarchy. But as with many places, sometimes monarchs get to be rather egotistical, and the people chafed under the rule of the monarchs and eventually look to have uh, a change in government. And they look towards an individual who they called to rule, a fellow by the name of Draco, and in the 7th century, around the year 621, uh, Draco established a rule of law. What this did is it got rid of uh, the capricious rule of monarchs and got rid of vendettas between families by establishing a set of laws that were established under which everybody would live. Codified laws were something that had emerged much earlier on in Mesopotamia. But these codified laws were very, very severe. The punishment didn't always fit the crime. So, for example, you could steal a cabbage and lose your hand. Uh, so these laws were very, very harsh. And it didn't deal with all of the problems in society. Again, in a fallen society, it's hard to uh, always get along as one person uh, is willing to uh, compromise their relationship with other people in order to get ahead. So amongst the Athenians, uh, they eventually looked to the judgments of a fellow by the name of Solon. Around the year 594, Solon uh, came through with some new laws and a new arrangement of society. Under his society, they had what's known as a democracy. Uh, this would be where you have participation in government based upon your financial uh, situation. So people who have a lot of resources have greater involvement in government. They have the greater potential, greater participation in government as a result. But it wasn't just in the area of politics that Solon made changes. He pushed the people uh, to look beyond just surviving on the food that they could grow locally uh, to engaging more and more in trade, and he made it so that people who lived as visitors uh, could engage in trade. So merchants are going to be encouraged and the people are going to be encouraged to move from just growing crops. They couldn't grow enough grain crops to feed their people. So instead they're going to start to grow uh, more olive trees from which they can make oil. 
and to grow more grapevines from which they can press wine. These are things that could grow on the hillsides around Athens. So the limited plains could only grow so much grain, but by changing their crops they would depend upon trading with people who had grain uh, and exchanging these uh, valuable commodities that they were able to grow uh, given their geographical context. So this is going to be something that helps to change Athens. He develops an assembly of citizens uh, and uh, again in this society people who are wealthy get to participate more in government and would serve on something called the Areopagus. This would be a ruling council. But you only get to participate in those kinds of groups if you're wealthy. So the poor didn't have the best representation in this government. As we go about a hundred years later to the time period of 508, as Athens struggles to respond to its various challenges, what we find is that under Cleisthenes, they would develop a democracy. The old struggles amongst the different tribes would be put aside as he would engage in dividing the people into ten new tribes. Previous to this, people had been particularly interested in their tribes and also in their position. The people who lived on the coast had some interests, particularly about trade. The people who lived on the plain were interested in growing crops, and the people who lived in the mountains were interested in uh, you know, the crops that they were able to grow and the mining that went on. And so there are three different strategies for subsistence which were being uh, pursued at the same time. But what Cleisthenes did was in creating these ten new tribes is that he engaged in dividing the people so that their interests uh, were going to be represented in the government. As these new tribes cut across old tribal divisions and uh, old uh, political interests. And so these different tribes would have uh, different geographical areas that were embedded within them. And this would shape uh, their identity as tribes. So we have the beginning of democracy as you have an ecclesia, this assembly in Athens, where uh, male citizens could participate in governance. Now day by day the ecclesia didn't meet. Uh, they were ruled by a boule. Um, and essentially the different deems, that would be these new tribes, would elect people to represent them 50 men at a time. So there's 500 people in the boule, and 50 men at a time uh, would each be responsible for one-tenth of the year. So you have a rotating responsibility for governance. Uh, ideally nobody becomes too terribly powerful, and the boule would select uh, war, war leaders, uh, strategos, who uh, would engage in uh, political activity. One of the balances on having too much power uh, was the development of the practice of ostracism. An ostracon is a piece of pottery upon which somebody writes. And so with the assembly meeting once a year on this topic, they could vote out uh, in an honorable exile uh, one of their citizens who had to go away for 10 years because they were perceived to be a threat uh, to the democracy in one way or another. Under Solon and eventually Cleisthenes' uh, changes in Athens, the city grew, particularly as it was favorable, open to people and to trade, open to ideas. This would be something that would make it very different from the closed society of Sparta. Sparta is located in the Peloponnesus to the south, in the Lyconian River Valley. Uh, it had open plains around it, but they too were limited, surrounded by mountains. Unlike this, reforms of Draco and Solon in particular, uh, in Sparta they would be shaped by the reforms of Lycurgus around the year 610. Lycurgus changed their society in significant ways and helped them to respond to their circumstances at that point in time, which would then be perpetuated uh, for generations that would follow. Under Lycurgus reforms, uh, the Spartans, who were adoring people, uh, had a dual monarchy. They had two royal families. 
So if you go into battle, you only send one king at a time. Beyond this uh, dual monarchy, they'd also have a gerousia, a, a, their assembly. And this assembly would be made up of true male Spartans. But it's very important for true male Spartans to be prepared for battle because some years before they'd conquered their neighbors, the Messinians, a people in a valley just to the west. And these Messinians come to be known as helots. They're essentially enslaved, agricultural slaves. Uh, the helots outnumbered the Spartans, but the Spartans were superior in warfare, and the Spartans basically each year declared war on the helots to justify uh, their oppression of these people. Under Lycurgus reforms, uh, they had the dual monarchy, and then they had five ephors. Uh, these five rulers uh, were made up of uh, leaders who were selected by the assembly of true male Spartans over 30 years of age. This society is one that was very much controlled towards developing strong citizens who were able to fight. It's through the domination of their neighbors, the Messinians, uh, that these Spartans, who were sometimes outnumbered as many as 20 to 1, would dominate their neighbors. They're great warriors, and they're trained to be warriors from the very beginning. The E-Force, for example, would judge new children who were born to determine whether a child should survive and be raised or be exposed because it would be an a, 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 a liability to society rather than an asset. So this is a pretty hardcore group of people, but they're, they're raising people to be warriors in particular. This is the mindset of both women as well as men. Uh, boys were raised from an early age, as early as six, they're taken away from their family, and they go to live with their cohort, an age group that trains them to be tough. And they don't live at home with their parents. Um, they're going to be trained in their cohort to be warriors, trained to be tough, trained to endure hardship, trained to be clever, particularly trained at military things. So running and jumping, throwing spears, uh, fighting, these are things that they valued. The Spartans under Lycurgus didn't allow people who were uh, true male Spartans to be engaged in business. Uh, they could be people who controlled land and produced grains, uh, particularly under helots that they dominated, but they depended upon outsiders to do the work of mer merchants. Now, they kept this down as much as possible, but they had to have some trade with outsiders. But those outsiders could never become citizens. Unlike th those people who were neighbors and traders could become citizens in Athens and could have certain privileges, in Sparta they're always kept uh, at a distance uh, for fear that they might cause people to uh, value things beyond Sparta. Amongst these early Greeks, in these Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta, we'll find that there's a competition that emerges between these that some people might have compared in the 20th century to the rivalry between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, this is certainly part of your instructor's experience as a boy growing up as he watched Olympic Games, was always seeing the East against the West. Amongst the Greeks of old, we find something they did share culturally were the Panhellenic Games. There are actually a number of these games to which Greek-speaking people from the various city-states were invited. The most famous of those uh, that persists in a form today is the Olympics. The Olympics is identified as beginning around the year 776 BC. So that's back in the time period here uh, as we're just coming out of these dark ages when these cities are engaged in colonization. Uh, this is a way that they could compete with each other without actually going to war. Most of the games, however, do have a uh, war component behind the things that they did. Uh, there are some interesting things you might think about in these Olympic games. Uh, one of the things, for example, that they had in the ancient Olympics was music. Now, you might be like me and find that to be something that might be subjective and to think that perhaps uh, you know, that would depend upon who's judging. It's kind of like ice skating. Uh, through what eyes do you see the art, artistry of the individuals? You know, is there an objective standard or is there a subjective uh, 
evaluation in the artistic performance of somebody who's doing a floor exercise in uh, gymnastics. So music, well, that's that's going to be something that's subjective, you might think, but there's a very definite military uh, component to music and why it would be included. Uh, this is that when you're marching in a phalanx, uh, you do well to march in order, to take similar size steps, to march in rhythm. Otherwise, you know, you might poke somebody with your deadly sharp pointy weapon that you have. Uh, so it's, it's useful to keep uh, the group working together in battle as they might sing going into battle or uh, as they develop the use of ships that they would row uh, together. So uh, singing was something that kept people together in various activities and it would prove to be a military asset. Uh, beyond the Panhellenic Games, these cities also shared some religious shrines, but uh, we're going to find these classical Greek city-states had their challenges with each other, uh, and that these challenges would, in some extent, drive them together. As we think about uh, the contributions of archaic uh, Greek society, as we come from the Minoans and Mycenaeans, into the classical Greek world, what we find is that God is at work. The, he knows about these people. This is something he reveals in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, where we find that Daniel reveals to King Nebuchadnezzar the coming of future kingdoms. And amongst those would be the Greek kingdom of Alexander the Great. He's the subject of a number of uh, those visions that Daniel has. First in Daniel chapter 2, in the uh, uh, vision of the statue made of different metals. Uh, the third part of that statue, the belly and the thighs of bronze, are representative of the Greeks. We move on to Daniel chapter 7. What we find is that, that uh, there's a vision of a leopard that's there that describes the Greeks once again. And in chapter 8, there's a vision of a goat. And we're going to find this is represented of uh, the descendant of the Greeks, Alexander the Great. And we can talk about that some later. But it's interesting here to think about how God works in time. These Greeks who lived on uh, rather thin soil out in the middle of the Mediterranean, far, far away, are going to have a great impact on Greek society and in God's working in the world and in contributing to Western society.